Hello, and welcome to another installment of Grasping Scripture. Today, we're going to delve into James chapter 3. Now, the book of James is a fascinating book, written by a pastor to his basically scattered congregation around the Mediterranean, encouraging them in a time of challenge for the early Christian church. And as we look at these passages, I think what you'll find is some very practical application because James doesn't, as you might expect him to, I don't know, he doesn't really delve into a lot of deep theology, although there is a lot of good deep theology underlying this, but he is highly practical and he is concerned with the way we live reflecting our faith in Christ, that we live out our faith. And so I find the book of James quite encouraging and quite challenging personally, because it calls on me to live my faith out. Hopefully it calls on you to do just the same. So I thank you for joining us today as we dive in to this third chapter of the book of James. Thanks for joining us. Let's turn to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll turn to his word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I do thank you that you have blessed us with your word, that you have given us the Christ, God in the flesh, to reveal to us the fullness of who God is, that we may know him, but not just know him from afar, but Father, that through Christ, through trust in his sacrifice for us, through the indwelling presence of his spirit, that we may know you and that we might receive salvation. Lord, we thank you for your mercy and grace. We thank you for your word that challenges us to grow in that relationship with you and to live it out in this world. Lord, help us to understand your word today. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. All right, as we look at the third chapter of James, I would encourage you if you need background or you haven't listened to the first two podcasts on the book of James, covering chapter one and two, chapter one involves some of the background setting, time and place, that sort of thing. Uh, Go back and listen to that. It'll give you a frame of reference for this. But if you want to just dive in today, uh, what James is talking about is very practical and it applies to all of us. Now he's writing to believers, so this is going to apply to believers more than anybody else, but it is still God's truth being revealed through his word, and anyone can benefit from hearing the truth of God. So whether you know Christ as Savior and Lord or not, I welcome you as part of this study as we look at the third chapter of the book of James. Well, turning our attention to the text... I mentioned last time around that James kind of, when he changes thought or is re-gearing his discussion with his audience, he begins again by saying, literally, it's dear brothers, but I'm reading from the New Living Translation, which translates it dear brothers and sisters, which conveys the thought because brothers, when he said it, would have meant all believers, not just the guys. The English translation for New Living Translation just makes that clearer that he's including everyone, male and female. It's not gender specific. It's it's Christ specific. So again, chapter three begins this way. Dear brothers and sisters, not many of you should become teachers in the church. Well, that sounds backwards, doesn't it? Shouldn't everybody want to be a teacher? Well, understand what was going on. The church was experiencing persecution, and actually it was that that first onset of persecution that drove the church out of Jerusalem. This congregation that James is writing to was his congregation in Jerusalem that is now scattered. And so in the context of when he is writing, the church is an outcast. The church is being rejected by the society around it, uh, is beginning to experience oppression, not just by the, the paganistic Roman and, and Greco-Roman society, but also is starting to experience persecution and rejection from the Jewish society. Now, mind you, at this time, Christianity was still seen as a sect of Judaism. 
And so this was really a time of transition. They were outcasts. They were suffering for their faith. And in that context, you may be an outcast in society, but if you desired a position of maybe authority, uh, uh, some sort of a position that might bring you dignity, then you might go, hey, I may be a part of a group of outcasts, but if I become a teacher in a group of outcasts, then that makes me somebody. And that's not a proper motivation. But acknowledging that that is something quite natural to humanity, especially in our fallen and broken state, uh, James gives that warning, you know, to not operate out of that earthly framework, to not operate out of that, that sinful desire for acknowledgement and for authority, but instead understand God does call some people to teachers. But as he says, not many of you should become teachers in the church. And he goes on for we who teach will be judged more strictly. I mean, you're thinking, oh, I become a teacher. I have some authority. I have influence. And he's going, no, 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 no. You become a teacher and you're going to be judged more strictly. And that's not just judged by the church, by those in the church, based on what you teach, that sort of thing. But this is judged by God, held accountable for the responsibility and influence on others. It is a serious thing to be a teacher of God's word because you need to do it well you need to do it grounded. It doesn't mean we're flawless, but it means that as a teacher of God's word, we understand God is going to hold us specifically accountable, not just for our lives, the choices we make, how we live in faithfulness to him, but held accountable for the influence that we are on others. If we are teaching falsely, then we are leading others away from God. Now they'll be judged according to their relationship with God, the decisions they made, whether they turned to him in faith, but we will be judged by the influence that we were on them. And so becoming a teacher within the context of the church that's a big deal. It is a place of responsibility and shouldn't be pursued because of the authority or honor that you may perceive is there, but needs to be understood that if you enter into that, it is a position of responsibility and a position in which God is going to strictly judge you or judge you more strictly. So there's just the first verse, a warning thrown out there to those that may be seeking that position or authority uh, because they feel that they've lost position or authority in society and it's a context in which they can do it. And he's going, no, that's, that's not what the pursuit should be. You should not do that. Not many of you should become teachers in the church. For we who teach will be judged more strictly. Indeed, verse two, indeed, we all make many mistakes. For if we could control our tongues, we would be perfect and could also control ourselves in every other way. Now, does he mean that if we could really control our tongues and everything else would fall in line? Well, maybe because none of us can control our tongues, so we'll never know, will we? But his point is this, we can't get just this piece of meat between our teeth to behave itself much less keep the rest of life in line perfectly. We are sinners. Now, we are redeemed. That's not an excuse for our sin or our, our shortcomings or uh, even our mistakes. But it is a statement of fact. It is who we are. It is our condition. We are redeemed sinners when we have trusted in Christ. We are declared righteous in the eyes of God. When he looks at us, he sees the righteousness of Christ that has covered us. But as long as we're walking this earth, we are being sanctified. We are growing in faith and obedience to Christ. But we are not perfect. We are not sinless. We're not there yet. We have to rely on the grace and mercy of God found in Christ because we desperately need it. None of us are above that. None of us have reached that point of being glorified. 
We've been justified through Christ. We are being sanctified as we live our lives for him and as we grow in our faith and obedience to him. But we're not glorified yet. So as he says, indeed, we all make many mistakes. For if we could control our tongues, we would be perfect and could also control ourselves in every other way. So the tongue is an example of the problem. But also the tongue is a tremendous influence. He goes on in verse 3. He says, we can make a large horse go wherever we want by means of a small bit in its mouth. And a small rudder makes a huge ship turn wherever the pilot chooses to go, even though the winds are strong. In the same way, the tongue is a small thing that makes grand speeches, but a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire. And the tongue and the tongue is a flame of fire. It is a whole world of wickedness corrupting your entire body. It can set your whole life on fire, for it is set on fire by hell itself. Now, that term hell there, some English translations will translate the Greek Hades, which is land of the dead, as the word hell. That's not a good translation. This isn't that. This, the word hell there, is the word Gehenna. It's what Jesus talked about when he talked about um, that place of judgment reserved for Satan and all that side with him, that place of eternal fire and torment, that hell. He says the tongue itself, it is set on fire by hell itself. So what is he saying in all of this? Because that sounds kind of, wild, doesn't it? Well, it is. He's saying that just like that horse, that the bit controls the horse or the rudder controls the ship or a a small fire or small spark can set a whole forest on fire, that this little thing, our tongue, what our tongue does, what it says, what it communicates, that our tongue influences, guides, controls in some regard who we are and what goes on in our life. We can utter words without thinking that devastate, or we can say things that build up. We can point people towards salvation in Christ and a right relationship with God, or we can point people away. And there are times we allow our tongue to speak the things of hell. And it sets our world on fire. It destroys, it burns, it brings pain and suffering. And so James is warning, hey, yeah, we all struggle with this. You know, for if we could control our tongues, we'd be perfect. So he's saying this this is a struggle we all have. But in that struggle, we need to know what we're dealing with. And we need to control our tongues because it matters. It matters. As we continue on in verse 7, he says, People can tame all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, fish, but no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless, or excuse me, it is restless and evil, full of, of deadly poison. So there we've had this reference to hell, Gehenna, which, which kind of implies the presence of Satan in this. Uh, Even this, it is full of evil, full of deadly poison. That is almost, uh, and it seems to be a reference kind of back to the serpent in the Garden of Eden. Sometimes it praises our Lord and Father, and sometimes it curses those that have been made in the image of God. 
Now understand that's a, that's a dichotomy there. That's, that's pointing out the opposite that we have a problem because sometimes we praise God with our tongues. We say things that glorify God, that point other people to God. But then when we turn around and we curse those made in the image of God, those who by creation are designed to reflect God, when we curse them, we're doing just the opposite of praising God. These things don't go together. They don't belong together. They should not come from the same mouth. And yet that's the battle. That's the challenge with our tongue that we've got to take it under control. We've tamed all these types of animals and yet we still struggle right here. Right here with our tongues. He goes on in verse 10. And so, blessing and cursing come pouring out of the same mouth. Surely, my brothers and sisters, this is not right. Does a spring of water bubble out of both fresh and bitter water? Does a fig tree produce olives or a grapevine produce figs? No. And you can't draw fresh water from a salty spring. You see, in in the upper Jordan area, um, it was an area fed by springs, and some of those springs were fresh, and some of those springs sometimes flowed fresh and sometimes flowed bitter or flowed salty. They were brackish. That being the case, a town or a community could be sustained by those fresh springs. But if you tried to sustain a town on one of those brackish springs, it wouldn't work. You couldn't use it to water your livestock. The people couldn't use it. I mean, the the, the salt in it would just, you know, it didn't work. So he's saying, look, yeah, that spring may sometimes flow with fresh and sometimes flow with with salty or, or bitter water. But because it's unreliable in what flows from it, it's of no use. And looking at the example of uh, produce, you know, the type of tree it is produces the kind of fruit. You don't see one kind of fruit growing on a different kind of tree. I know you can graft on branches and all that jazz, but still it's the branch from the other tree. So deal with it. That's the challenge. When we look at our own lives, when we consider our own speech, the things we say, We have to evaluate it based on not what I intended, but instead upon, does this praise God or does it do the opposite? Because there is a world of evil out there that seeks to lead astray, that seeks to deceive, that seeks to diminish the message of the gospel. We cannot let that sinful side have control of our tongue. We must constantly stay in the battle and understand it is tremendously important that we control our tongues and that we praise God with them. Otherwise, if we enjoy both, then we're no better than those springs that can't sustain a community. And of course, all this goes back to say, and if we're aspiring to be a teacher within the church, think of how much more significant that is because we're an influence on others in that position and within the body. But it matters all the time, even if you're not a teacher. So James throws this out there and he hits them hard with it. I mean, this is a challenging thing and he doesn't claim superiority on it. He's not like, hey, I've got this figured out. Now y'all need to get it. No, he's like, we struggle with this. We would be perfect if we could control our tongues. But um, 
the tongue goes one way and the body follows. It's a mess. But we've got to fight it. Why? Because the two things don't go together. Let your speech, let your tongue glorify God and let your life follow it. Now, as we move into verse 13, he shifts a little bit and he starts talking about wisdom, true wisdom. Now, this still relates to the idea almost of, of teaching because we hope to teach wisdom within the body of Christ if you hold the position of teacher within the body. But also this desire, you know, hey, I'm part of an outcast group. I want a position of authority. I want to be a teacher. Uh, that desire reflects a certain kind of wisdom, not godly wisdom. That's earthly wisdom. And now he's talking about what godly wisdom is as opposed to earthly wisdom. And I hope you'll see the connection to the rest of the chapter as we look at these verses, 13 through the end. He says, if you are wise and understand God's ways, prove it by living an honorable life, doing good works with the humility that comes from wisdom. So there again, he's throwing down the gauntlet. This is much like in chapter two, where he talks about faith and works, that the works are the evidence of the faith, and you can't claim faith and not have the evidence, not have work to support it. So here he's saying, if you are wise and understand God's ways, you know, if you're going to make that claim, then in one simple word, prove it. Well, okay, that's two words. Prove it. Prove it by living an honorable life, doing good works with the humility that comes from wisdom. Because if you claim it's there, then we need to see it. Now, he holds this up as a standard for all believers. Okay, this isn't some select group within the church. He's talking to his congregation that's scattered and saying, look, this is what it is. If you're wise and you understand God's ways, then here's what it looks like in life. Do it. Prove it. Live it out. Verse 14. But. But if you are bitterly jealous... And there is selfish ambition in your heart. Don't cover up the truth with boasting and lying. For jealousy and selfishness are not God's kind of wisdom. Such things are earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. For wherever there is jealousy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and evil of every kind. Did you catch the severity of that? He's saying, if you're wise and you understand God's ways, live it out. And when you live it out, it looks like humility because that humility comes from wisdom. It looks like living an honorable life and doing good works and expressing humility in that. And it's not a false humility. Uh, Carrie Newhoff, pastor in Toronto, uh, quote that he gives that I, I really like and that has challenged me, and I remind myself of it often. We can either live in humility as followers of Christ, and humility is when we humble ourselves, or we can live humiliated, which is when other people humble us. I'm thinking humility sounds a whole lot better than humiliated. So to get there, I have to humble myself. I have to truly experience humility before God and live that out among others. Because if I don't, then I may fit the description in verse 14 and following. If you are bitterly jealous and there is selfish ambition in your heart, so you may say, I'm wise, but you're jealous of other people and you become bitter towards other people because of what they have or what you want. He says, don't cover that up with lying and boasting. For jealousy 
and selfishness are not God's kind of wisdom. So if your life manifests jealousy and selfishness, understand you are not living out godly wisdom. You're not grasping hold of godly wisdom. In fact, you are doing just the opposite. You are embracing the lies of the devil and living that out. And you may have convinced yourself it's a good thing, but it's not. Jealousy and selfishness are not God's kind of wisdom. Such things are earthly. They are unspiritual. And the last word of verse 15, they are demonic. Demonic. That's how seriously James takes this. When we start acting out of jealousy and selfishness, we are behaving just like the demons. We are behaving demonically. I don't want that to be me. Do you want that to be you? Because the way to not go down that road is to not embrace the wisdom of this earth, to not embrace that unspiritual, that demonic viewpoint of jealousy and selfishness, but instead to live an honorable life, to do good works with humility that humility that comes from wisdom, that comes from knowing God. And back to chapter one, if you lack wisdom, ask God who gives generously and he will give it to you. We do not have to live without godly wisdom. If we know him, turn to him and ask him for it. Verse 16, for wherever there is jealousy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and evil of every kind. You wonder why our world is so messed up? You look around and you say, look at the corruption, look at the, the pain and the suffering, look at, look at the evil in this world, what's going on? That is our world's wisdom at work. Because wherever there is jealousy and selfishness and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and evil of every kind. That can't be part of the life of the church. I know that it is because I know there are jealous and selfishly ambitious people in the life of the church. But it ought not to be. We are called to a higher standard. And we get there by humbling ourselves before God. By living an honorable life, doing works with humility that comes from wisdom. And that's godly wisdom. Are we there? Are you there? The question I have to ask myself, am I there? Which one of these describes me? And I have to struggle with that. I hope that you do too. That together we will live our lives in such a way to glorify God and build up his kingdom. That we will not be those those springs that give brackish water that can't be relied on and can't be built around. But instead, we will point others to Christ and we will live for him and glorify him with our tongues and with our lives. Let that be us. Let us not pursue. Let us not be driven by jealousy and selfish ambition. Those shouldn't be part of who we are. We should root them out and excise them. Verse 17. 17 and 18. 
we'll round out the chapter with those. So in 17, it says, but the wisdom, so here's that contrast. It's talked about earthly wisdom, what it looks like. He says, but the wisdom from above is first of all, pure. It is also peace loving, gentle at all times and willing to yield to others. It is full of mercy and good deeds. It shows no favoritism and it is always sincere. And those who are peacemakers will plant seeds of peace and reap a harvest of righteousness. Now I want to go back to verse 17 again, because did you hear that list? I mean, this is a great list of what godly wisdom looks like in our lives lived out. And the things that don't fit this list that are part of our lives are things we need to root out. The things in our churches that don't fit this list are the things that do not belong. But the wisdom from above is first of all, pure. Pure. Not tainted. Not twisted and distorted. Not mixed motives or mixed allegiances. It is pure. It is, I am following Christ. And it is about Christ and Christ alone. Hey, that'd make a pretty good song. But the wisdom from above is first of all pure. It is also peace loving. You know, those people that like to fight. Yeah. Not wisdom from above. There are people that, you know, you know who they are. Maybe you are them. You know it. People like stir things up. Oh, it's too boring when people aren't in conflict. But if I say this little statement over here, or I say this about this person, then it'll get these folks going. The wisdom from above, godly wisdom, heavenly wisdom is pure. It is peace loving. It is gentle at all times. You know, this kind of reminds me of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, that description of God's love and the gift of God's love, what it looks like manifested in our lives. Coincidence? I don't think so. It is also peace loving, gentle at all times and willing to yield to others. What's that mean? It means it's not about me. It means it's about God. Willing to yield to others. It is full of mercy and good deeds. Mercy. Mercy isn't justice. Mercy isn't deserved. Mercy is an act of love given to those that do not deserve what they are receiving. Justice is you get what you deserve. Mercy is... I'm not going to visit upon you what you deserve, but something better. It is full of mercy and good deeds. It shows no favoritism. It's always sincere. It doesn't play games. It doesn't manipulate situations or people for its own gain, even though it may look like it's not for its own. The reason I'm doing this is because it benefits me in some way or will down the road. Now, that's back to selfish ambition, isn't it? Yeah, it's not there. It shows no favoritism, and it's always sincere. What an awesome verse. What a challenging verse but it helps us correct course. It helps us evaluate our own life, our own church, our own situation and say, does this fit godly wisdom? Or is this starting to look like the world's wisdom with jealousy and selfish ambition? I pray that we will always correct course back to godly wisdom. And that when we lack it, we will humble ourselves and call on God, asking him to give us wisdom, that we would glorify him 
as individual believers and as churches. And then lastly, again, verse 18, and those who are peacemakers will plant seeds of peace and reap a harvest of righteousness. Oh, that's the kind of farming I want to do. Don't you? Let's glorify God with what we say and by the way we live our lives. Let's live them with godly wisdom that glorifies our Savior and points others to Him. I hope you find this chapter challenging in a good way and that it inspires you to move forward in your faith in Christ. And if you don't know Christ and you've got questions or even you know, maybe you've had bad experience with, with churches or, or uh, Christian people and you're reading this going, that's, that's what it's supposed to be. Maybe that's not what I've seen, but that's, that's what the Bible says it's supposed to be. Yeah. Yeah, it is. And I'm sorry that you've encountered those that claim the name of Christ that don't live up to this and the truth is we all fall short of this but we're working on it and God's working on us and we invite you to know him to truly come to know Christ as Savior and as Lord and to join us in this journey of faith let us again turn to God in prayer Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you that you have not given up on us. We thank you that you have not abandoned us. And Lord, we thank you that you don't just leave us to our own devices, but you call us to something more. And you empower us to live out that something more in you. Father, I pray that you will help us to root out that selfishness, that selfish ambition, that jealousy that we harbor in our hearts, that we would root that out, that we would get it out of the way, that it would not be our motivation, that we wouldn't cling to the wisdom of this world that is twisted and broken. But Father, that we would live out our faith in you, that we would do it showing godly wisdom and all that that means so that we may glorify you and bring others to experience life in you. Not just life, but life to the fullest. Father, we thank you for your grace and mercy and your word. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.